<laughs> I got the impression from this, this Why Pluto Matters chapter in Unscientific America that there was some sense that there was a, an arrogance and disdain on the part of the scientific community which was representative of the disconnect at the science and society level between the practitioners and the recipients, that sort of handing down wisdom kind of... Well, I, I can't comment on what their interpretations are. I can tell you that um, there was a lot of talk about the fact that the astronomers should listen to the public about how we might classify our cosmic object. And I thought that that was, that's not how science proceeds. You don't, you don't go to the medical doctors and find them polling the public to find out what they should call their next medicine or what their next discovery is under the microscope. No other science subjects themselves to public participation in how they're going to classify the frontier of their research. So, so astrophysicists should be under no obligation to poll the public. I don't care how deeply affectionate you felt for these objects that, that we had talked about. Now that's not arrogance, that's just simple common sense about what it is to move a frontier and the sensitivities you need on that frontier to classify or not. Now, what I was entertained by is if scientists can't agree, it's kind of fun to get public to then weigh in on it, which is kind of what happened here. Just to see maybe there is someone who has some insights, because clearly the scientists, you know, are not agreeing. So why not look somewhere else to find out who can help out? And I don't have a problem with that, but not as a matter of policy. You do that because it's a fun diversion, not because it's, okay, now it's time to get the public to help us. No other science does that. You wouldn't want another science to do that. It's not how it works. So if that's, if that's, what's called arrogance, that's a misuse of the word arrogance. Arrogance would be, we, ar arrogance would be, we don't even want to tell you what's going on. An arrogant scientist is one who shields, not shields the wrong word, who, who distances his or her own research from the taxpaying public that enabled the research to happen in the first place. That's an arrogant scientist. An arrogant scientist is one who doesn't even take the effort to communicate what's going on in the frontier with the public. That's an arrogant scientist. That's a scientist who, who sees it as beneath them to communicate with the public. We're, we live in a time now where there's no room for that. But it's very difficult, isn't it, to figure out how to do that? Because the, let me take the case... No, 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 no. bull. It's, it's more difficult to figure out how the universe works. And we have people actively engaged in that. It's more difficult to understand the structure of the atomic nucleus. That's more difficult than figuring out how to talk to another human being. I don't buy that for a minute. It's just a matter of spending some brain energy, some of the formidable brain energy that's otherwise deducing the nature of the physical world. Now figure out how to talk to your neighbor. Mm. Just take a class in interpersonal communication. It's not hard. Just do it. Whatever it is you accomplish, you'll be better at it, whether or not you'll ever become great at it, you'll be better at it tomorrow than you were today. And you keep that up for a little bit, not only does the frontier of science benefit from that, because the public who now understands your science is voting for congressmen to allocate monies to agencies that fund that science, everybody benefits. So it's, it's, it's a challenge, but it's not the biggest challenge those scientists would have faced in their lives. It's a challenge, and it's obviously a challenge that's been met well by people like Carl Sagan, Jacob Bonofsky, and so on, you're doing it yourself now. Um, my point was that you would, nobody would claim that Richard Dawkins is a bad communicator. I mean, he spends a lot of time, major effort, websites and so on, trying to put out information. Yet, as you well remember, at Beyond Belief 1 in 2006, even there, you had to sort of have a word with him about the, the way in which he was... That's to this day my most viewed YouTube clip. Well, it, it's actually the 76th most discussed all time and the 90th uh, most rated of all time in the how-to and style section on YouTube, not even science and technology. It's been viewed of all time, of all, of all? Yes, seven, over 700,000 over, views. And what you said to him after he had felt that uh, one of the other presenters' um, presentations perhaps was lacking. You're a professor of the public understanding of science, not professor of delivering truth to the public. 
And these are two different exercises. One of them is you put the truth out there, and like you said, they either buy your book or they don't. Well, that's not being an educator. That's just putting it out there. Being an educator is, part, is not only getting the truth right, but there's got to be an act of persuasion in there as well. Persuasion isn't always, here's the facts, you're either an idiot or you're not. It's, it's, here are the facts, and here, is, and here is a sensitivity to your state of mind, and it's the facts plus the sensitivity, when convolved together, creates impact. And I worry that your, your methods, how articulately barbed you can be, ends up simply being ineffective yeah. when, when you have much more power of influence than what is currently reflected in your output. I gratefully accept the rebuke. Um, <laughs> um, and everyone was, broke out in laughter because right. no one expected that. And there was, it was they, a nice, they were ready for a fight. It was a right. nice exchange, but this does make my mm -hmm. point that it is not as easy to convey very complicated information at a level that is satisfactory to the practitioners of it and is informative to the recipients of it. It's hard, but so what? So, do we, do, do we choose to do things because they're easy? No. I sound like Kennedy. We choose to do it because it's hard. You do hard things because there is the reward of having achieved it when you're done. Well, it, sounds, it sounds here as though, this is something else you said. Oh, wait, by the way, yeah. I would distinguish, no one would deny that Hawkins is one of the great uh, communicators of our day. He's got his books, they're bestsellers and all the like. But I'd, I'd rather slice uh, Dawkins. Yeah, sorry. Uh, I'd rather I'd rather unpack the word communicator and split it into two categories. One of them is: Are you effective at what you do? That's what kind of what communication means. It means you have a message, someone receives it. There are two ends to that line segment. That's different from: Are you articulate? He's articulate. That man Dawkins. You know, he's got a level of articulation of his delivery that would make any American jealous, all right? It's why we all wish we had some kind of fraction of the literary education that goes on in the United Kingdom over here. So he'll say, he'll make his point, and he'll say exactly what he means, and he'll mean exactly what he says, and he'll say it with brilliant juxtaposition of words, words that we hardly ever hear much over here, but are brilliantly put together in a sentence. Yes, he's articulate. Is the message working? If it's not working, why not? Because being articulate is not the same thing as communicating. Communicating is understanding the mind of who you're talking to. Not just how great is your oration, let people come to it and, and paw at it and study it. Are you, talking, are you speaking straight to the soul of the person you're communicating with? And I don't think he is. Because there are people who are not as articulate as he is, who are actually put off by the weight of his expertise of oration. And I'm not trying to say he should, um, what am I trying to say? Uh, I'm trying to say that if he spent more time studying the mind of his listeners and wanted to have an effect on that mind, he would not communicate in the ways, he, he would not speak in the ways that he does. Because there's a sharpness to it. There's a, there's a wit to it. There's a it's so sharp and so witty that it's almost aggressive. And it just, it can turn people off. And it does turn people off. 